What's up, everybody? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel, and then follow me on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter so you guys don't miss any of our content over the course of this season. All right, let's talk some basketball. All right, before we get out of here today, we're going to talk a little bit about the Lakers Nuggets series. So uh, one of the things I talked about last night, if you guys remember is the fact that the Lakers have some bad habits that have been around all season long and they reared their ugly head in a big game. And one of the things I talked about last night is believe teams when they tell you who they are. And what I mean when I say that is your habits are what carry you when the shit hits the fan late in the season, right? That's something I talk about all the time, but that doesn't just go for good habits. That goes for bad habits. If you have a bad habit of losing sight of execution details when another team is on a run, then you're going to run into a good team in a playoff series. They're going to go on a run. Your execution will tail off and the run will be catastrophic. That was an issue all season long for the Lakers. These brief little two or three minute stretches where they'd let go of the rope and get blitzed and either leads would disappear or they'd have uh, uh, be in a game where it's tied and suddenly they'd be down double figures. This was an issue all year long and it was a big part of game one against Denver. As a matter of fact, the Lakers blew this game. They were super competitive with Denver throughout except for two stretches. There was a 10-0 run in less than two minutes in the middle of the second quarter, and a 13-0 run in three and a half minutes in the middle of the third quarter. And so I wanted to go into the film just to show you guys exactly how bad uh, uh, the Lakers' offensive execution and defensive execution was when they were in this stretch. And one of the things I want you to keep in mind, LeBron actually talked about this uh, after the game in his presser. He said, every championship team he's been on has had attention to detail. And, you know, I, like, I want to be clear because LeBron has some guilt here. You're going to see, I, I when I went back to look at the film, I actually think LeBron was the primary driving force for both of these ugly stretches. And LeBron has a tendency to kind of get fatigued after he kind of goes on a crazy run where he plays really hard. And he did, like, literally for a quarter and a half, LeBron was guns blazing. And then he got tired and re was really bad for a couple of minutes, just literally two minutes. And it was a 10-0 run. And then in the second half, same sort of thing. And so, like, the, uh, ironically, LeBron's right in the sense that the Lakers' lack of attention to detail is a the opposite of a hallmark of a champion, right? But he also shares some blame for uh, for that predicament with the Lakers. So let's get into the film here again. So uh, out of a this is out of a timeout, if I remember correctly. The Lakers are up by 12, right? So this is the position in the game where the Lakers have been playing really well. And uh, they've been playing really well, but one of two things can happen here. You can either keep your foot on the gas and try to maintain the lead slash build the lead slash whatever it is you're going to do to get out of here with the win, or you can immediately relax. And as soon as the Lakers get it to 12, we're going to get a relax right away. Watch LeBron here in the weak side corner against Michael Porter Jr. Watch Michael Porter Jr. cut up to the top of the key and watch LeBron relax. So LeBron, look, falling asleep. On his heels, Michael Porter Jr. runs up and gets a, a, a good look at a catch-and-shoot three because LeBron's not paying attention. Watch the first step. This It's literally the first step that does him in here. He's not engaged. He's not paying attention. Michael gets just a little bit of a running start on him, and then and then LeBron's completely out of position. See that? See how that that just that little bit of a delay? But before LeBron actually takes a step, Michael's already going. He's That gap can't happen. When we talk about lock and trail defense, it literally means lock and trail. It means you are locked on the backside of the offensive player and trailing them over the screen. This is bad lock and trail defense. And all it was is, once again, LeBron relaxed for a split second, got up to 12, and instead of taking that as an opportunity to get more serious, he got more relaxed. This is the very next possession. This was just a bad call. I didn't like this call. So LeBron uh, goes and sets a screen, a back screen on, on KCP and then slips out of it. LeBron doesn't even actually hit KCP. He just slips out of the screen. But right as he's slipping, KCP takes like a, a, a really aggressive backward steps and runs into LeBron. That's incidental contact. That shouldn't have been a foul. It was a bad call. But bad calls happen in NBA games. It just it is what it is. Uh, but the turnovers became a problem for the Lakers. So Reggie Jackson is going to miss a little floater over Spencer Dinwiddie here. They're going to push out the other way. 
And, you know, one of the things we're going to talk about at the end of the show here, I'm going to talk with you guys about the Lakers kind of free throw dis- discrepancy thing. And I did some digging into some numbers to essentially prove that it's completely unremarkable that the Lakers are a good free throw disparity team, which we'll get to in a minute. But I've talked about often on the show that it's actually a net negative for the Lakers in some ways. Anthony Davis is a grifter. Austin Reeves is a grifter. So they're constantly trying to hunt the whistle and they will take unusual shots that are not normal basketball shots to try to draw fouls. And what will happen is they'll miss the shot, not get the call, and then they'll get barbecued in transition the other way. Here's a good example. So AD's got Michael Porter Jr. on him. And instead of making a physically aggressive move to the rim, he's going to flop and try to draw a foul. And then uh, uh, there's no call. And then he uh, starts jogging and kind of yelling at the ref a little bit, worrying about his elbow. And then watch as we go the other way, we're going to get a transition cross match. So again, AD is supposed to be on Gordon. LeBron is supposed to be on MPJ. And uh, actually in this in this configuration, Rui's, not, uh, Rui's here. So Rui is supposed to be on Jokic, right? So as a result of this, everyone's in a cross match. Now Anthony Davis is on Michael Porter Jr. LeBron James is on Aaron Gordon. Austin Reeves is on Jokic. And because of that, they have no choice but to kind of load up uh, to deal with Jokic on Reeves, which opens up an easy skip pass for Aaron Gordon to the weak side corner to Reggie Jackson. So again, flop, no call, transition, easy bucket. So for every time AD falls and he gets foul shots, this has to be factored in as well as part of that equation and what comes out of it. Here's the very next offensive possession for the Lakers. What stands out to you here? Again, LeBron's tired. We're down to six here. And by the way, I want to be clear. Runs happen in basketball games. I'm not sitting here pretending like you're just going to dominate the entire game. There's never going to be a stretch that the other team is going to be able to put some points together, especially a championship team in Denver who's better than you. Like they're going to go on runs. The difference is you have to find a way to make that 10-0 run into a 7-2 run or a, a 13-0 run into a 10-6 run. You have to find a way to mitigate that as best as you can. It can't be a complete and total collapse on both ends of the floor. Here we go. The Nuggets just got back-to-back buckets, right? A three for Reggie Jackson and a three for Michael Porter Jr. We had an AD turnover and we had a LeBron turnover, even though it was a bad call. And you could make a case AD got fouled, but he was kind of grifting a little bit. So this is where you have to execute. And instead, LeBron throws this lazy-ass pocket pass. And again, when you throw the pocket pass, you have to get over the screen and engage the rim protector. LeBron does neither and just throws it. Both Aaron Gordon and both Aaron Gordon and Jokic have their hands down in the shooting pocket. And so when this pass goes, it has no chance of going through. Now it's a pick six the other way for Aaron Gordon in a in an easy dunk. So again, like this that possession is the possession where you have to execute and get a good shot. And LeBron James, your best player, just threw a stupid pocket pass that had no chance of going through and ends up being a turnover and a pick six the other way. That's a gap in execution. That's attention to detail that falls on LeBron's plate in this case. We're going to get a similar kind of lack of aggression here from LeBron on uh, Jamal Murray. So LeBron's going to get the switch with the Austin Reeves two-man game. He's got uh, uh, Jamal on him. He needs to make a physically aggressive move, and instead he takes this turnaround right shoulder fade, which, by the way, he's been missing. I I went over this on the show the other day, but uh, right shoulder fades on the left side of the floor out of the post for LeBron. He's been making at 26% this season. This is not a good shot. Jamal Murray literally blocks him, okay? Block happens. Now watch the transition possession for the Nuggets. I want you to watch LeBron and AD and watch these five guys. Watch the difference in their initial sprint at the transition opportunity. This is going to be jarring. Watch this. See that? Oh, massive gap forms here. Why is that? Because these two guys are not taking their transition defense responsibilities seriously, and those two guys in particular, because they deal with Gordon and Jokic, it is abundantly important for them to get back. They're actually very fortunate that Michael Porter Jr., uh, we'll see it again here, Look at that gap that immediately forms. That's a lack of urgency. LeBron and AD, shot goes up. They take a second to just kind of chill while every nugget knows as soon as the Lakers miss a layup, we are running. We are running every time. That is our chance to get an advantage. Michael Porter Jr. gets a really good look at a three on the left wing. He just happens to miss it. And what's crazy too is LeBron makes this crazy effort to sprint back into the play after the fact. 
that effort that effort is not even a problem if you don't make that mistake to begin with at the start of the transition defense possession. Again, so now the, the Nuggets are on a run, right? This lead is back to four. Your 12-point lead is almost gone. Time to execute, right? No, we're going to get a break rhythm, pump fake pull-up three from D'Angelo Russell that he airballs. See, the, the <laughs> again, like the Lakers are at their, at their best offensively, and we're going to see an example here in a few minutes. They're at their best offensively when they settle down, run their sets, get into an advantage situation, and play with their aggregate offensive talent. And they just have not done that yet in this sequence they haven't had a single good offensive play, uh, possession in this entire sequence. And then uh, this last possession for the Nuggets this is the end of the 10-0 run. So they're on an 8-0 run at this point. We're going to get a... Rui is on Jamal in a transition cross match and AD is on Jokic. So they're just going to switch it, which is fine. But one of the things that Rui does on the switch is he decides to front the post. Now, as soon as you decide to front the post, what's the other half of that coverage? This is something I've talked with you guys a lot about with the Miami Heat because they did a really good job of doing this in the NBA Finals last year. From here, Aaron Gordon's underneath the basket. LeBron James is the guy who has to be up here so that when Jamal throws this over the top pass, LeBron James can be there either on the catch to prevent a deep catch or to force a turnover here. And then it's on D'Lo and Austin to navigate these three guys. And they're not very well spaced. D'Lo can drop here and box out Aaron Gordon. Austin can easily rotate to these two guys. So literally, LeBron just has to do his job in the game plan here. Rui's fronting. I have to bracket from behind. Instead, LeBron is slow. Notice he doesn't start moving until after the pass. So Jokic catches deep, and he easily hits that little shot underneath the basket. So again, they went up 12. Opportunity to try to maintain control of the game. And in two minutes, less than two minutes... They barbecued 10 of those 12 points away with repeated bad offensive possessions and poor defensive execution. That, that Denver just keeps playing and just keeps executing. You let go of the rope for a couple of minutes in disaster strikes. And it's been a consistent theme for the Lakers all season long. Let's fast forward to the second half. Okay, so now we're looking at um, the the LeBron's going to miss this free throw and it's a one-point game here. Okay. Denver's first offensive possession. This is just really, really good offensive execution. You're going to see an example of what's called a pin-in flare. Okay, so we got Jokic in the post. We have uh, Spencer Dinwiddie guarding Nikola Jokic. We have um, uh, Jokic catch in the post, and we're going to get a, pa a double team from Spencer Dinwiddie one pass away. Right. So this is our three on two on the weak side. This is like a little triangle here. Right. So we have AD is effectively the low man. He's underneath the basket. Austin's got your two on one here, right? But Michael Porter Jr. is sliding up this way. And so Austin has to close out. Aaron Gordon is going to set what's called a pin in flare here. So his one job is to set a back screen on AD so that he can't close out to KCP. Now when Jokic throws the pass, watch. AD turns and he's trying to close out on KCP. Watch Aaron Gordon screen him. Boom. Wide open three for KCP. So really, really good offensive execution from Denver on that one. So Denver makes a three. They have a four-point lead. What are you doing here if you're the Lakers? This is where you need to settle down and get a really good offensive possession in and execute to get a good look. AD's tired. LeBron's tired. They've been working hard all game, right? AD is going to start floating around the three-point line. Spencer drives, kicks to Austin. AD backs out to the three-point line. They run a little Austin-LeBron two-man game. They actually switch this. Look at Aaron Gordon. Aaron Gordon drops down with Austin Reeves. There's 13 on the shot clock. As soon as that switch happens, Jamal's wanting to hedge and recover, but because Aaron Gordon goes with the slip, the matchup is there now. LeBron has the matchup. All he needs to do is re -get, it, get his dribble back, right? And in order to get his dribble back, all he needs to do is basically just throw a pass to Spencer Dinwiddie and get the ball back. Instead, he swings it across the court to Anthony Davis, who is a bad three-point shooter, who for whatever reason is floating around the three-point shot and is going to take a shot that he's probably going to miss the vast majority of the time. Now, if you remember, they just got burned uh, with Rui in single coverage off of a double team. Excuse me, not in single coverage, off of a double team. Now they're going to leave Rui in single coverage. Jokic is going to easily score. 
Okay. Some of this is just Denver. Denver's going to do this. They're a better team than the Lakers. They're going to have runs like this where they get baskets. That is why the offensive execution is so important for the Lakers on the other end of the floor. We go right back down now. Okay. Now Denver's up six. All right, Lakers, let's see if we can execute and get a really good shot. This is what happens. We get a Rui screen that leads to the Michael Porter Jr. switch. LeBron just kind of dribbles around on the perimeter. Nothing's going on. He picks up his dribble for whatever reason. AD's right here sitting at the elbow as an easy outlet that passes there, and LeBron literally just throws the ball out of bounds. Again, like you're, you're starting to see that you know LeBron LeBron was really good outside of these two runs. Like, really, really good. On both ends, he was great defensively. He was uh, excellent offensively out, outside of this stretch. These two stretches where LeBron got tired and played bad basketball literally cost his team the game. They have to find a way to avoid these stretches. All right, our next one here is a... Um, uh, Aaron Gordon misses a three in the corner. Lakers go down. So you get gifted another chance off of Aaron Gordon missing a three. You get gifted another chance here to try to have a good offensive possession. And we're going to get a bad read from Torian Prince in the Lakers five out here. So we get a AD screen and slip. That brings this tag over, right? This is an example of what I was talking about earlier. Run your horn sets, run your five out sets, get the defense in rotation. They do that here, but Torian Prince makes a mistake. So, LeBron comes off the screen. Jokic is at the level. That forces KCP to tag. Now, we have a two-on-one on the weak side here. Swing pass to Torian Prince. Boom. Extra pass. That's the read. Extra pass to D'Lo. And we're going to get a wide-open catch-and-shoot three. Okay? Instead, Torian drives it into the lane, into a bunch of bodies, and gets blocked. That's bad execution. That's a mistake that Denver doesn't make. Generally speaking, they're going to make that extra pass to the open shooter. Generally speaking, they're not going to over-penetrate and drive into all that traffic. That is a lack of execution. All right, this next one here. Um, that bad read from Torian Prince leads to the transition three from KCP, right? So off of that block, Denver running. Once again, five on three break. Just uh, And just watch again the way they run, man. Look at how Denver takes off as soon as the block happens. Let's back up a little bit. Watch the difference in the Lakers sprinting versus the Nuggets sprinting. Do you see that? Isn't that crazy? It's like this is like... the It's, it's hard to believe that the defending champ in this particular case is outworking the team that is like desperate to not get embarrassed. It's, it's, it's legitimately hard to watch on film. All right, so we're finally going to get a good offensive possession from the Lakers here. Now, they did it two possessions in a row. They ran, they're running their sets now. The last possession, they ran their set. Uh, Torian just botches the read, right? Here, we're going to get a screen into a dribble handoff. So D'Lo's going to come off and screen Aaron Gordon, and LeBron's going to come off of it this way, okay? So screen generates a little bit of separation for LeBron, okay? Jokic comes in the high drop. We get the tag from Christian Brown. That, or excuse me, the tag from Reggie Jackson and Christian Brown. But if Reggie Jackson tags harder, LeBron makes the read as Christian Brown is recovering out to D'Lo. He makes the read to Spencer Dinwiddie, throws the skip, Brown closes out, they get a wide open three. Okay, so again, we've gone through probably, I don't know what, 13, 12, 13 Laker offensive possessions over the course of these two runs that we've been covering. This is the first one that got a great shot. This is the first one. How, how often do you see the Nuggets go a dozen possessions where they get one great shot? That, again, the Lakers have the talent to be more competitive in this series. They just simply have to execute, and it's just a weakness of theirs. We're going to get another example here of uh, KCP misses this three, and actually there was a little bit of a hesitation from Torian Prince. Watch Torian Prince here as he sags off. KCP's red hot and has hit a bunch of threes, and he almost gives up another one here. Very fortunate that that one missed. Going out the other way, once again, we're going to see Anthony Davis lingering around the three-point line. So if AD literally in this action just simply screens and rolls into that space, if LeBron comes downhill and engages Jokic and AD rolls, that's going to pull Gordon in in all likelihood or Reggie, and you're going to get that exact same weak side two-on-one that you just got, and you're going to get another wide-open look for D'Lo. Instead, Anthony Davis pops to the three-point line. 
So nobody has to come in here. LeBron is now surrounded by four blue jerseys, and AD is going to take another three that he's not going to make because he's a below 30% three-point shooter. That's poor execution. How like you're just you're just running offense to get bad shots. Go right down to the other end. Delo's on KCP. As we talked about earlier, KCP is on fire at this point. It's hit a bunch of threes. This is a lock and trail possession. Watch him. He's going to fall asleep and KCP is going to shoot up. Look, just that little hesitation, just like what happened to LeBron. It's just that little hesitation being slow and KCP gets all the way off of him and gets another catch and shoot three and makes it. Again, that is a lock and trail responsibility. You literally have to know that his next move is some sort of aggressive cut to get a shot and you have to be locked up onto him the entire time. We're going to go to the other end of the floor. LeBron's going to force a really difficult pass here to Rui in traffic. It's going to get turned over the other way. And we're going to get, I think this is another cross match if I remember correctly. Uh, actually, no, it's just a post up of LeBron. So LeBron ends up on Jokic and Jokic scores over him. And again, this one is not on the defense, but over the course of this run, it's primarily offensive execution that's been the issue. But here you go. That's a 13 0 run. This was a one point game at the start of that possession. At the start of that sequence, it was a one point game. And now you're looking at a 14 point game in three and a half minutes because you let go of the rope in terms of execution for a short bit. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. I have six more clips that I want to show you guys. Just other notes of film uh, from this game. This was the very next shot that the Lakers got. So 13 0 run. This is the shot that LeBron gets. So we have a uh, D'Lo screen to get Reggie switched on to Spencer Dinwiddie. Dinwiddie's going to set a screen on Aaron Gordon. We're going to get another switch. LeBron's got Reggie. LeBron has Reggie Jackson on him with 11 seconds left. And this is the shot LeBron gets. By the way, there's nobody digging down on the right-hand side. He could make an aggressive move here, most likely pull in Reggie Jackson or open up a Rui on the weak side. He can generate a corner three with just a little bit of dribble penetration. And instead he takes this. Barely gets uh, gets the front of the rim. Here's another uh, kind of bad uh, uh, bad uh, read from D'Angelo Russell in pick and roll. Gets downhill. Everyone's packed in the paint. Gabe Vincent's wide open on the weak side. He tries to shoot a shot on DeAndre Jordan. Gets blocked. Then AD throws this gamble in the backcourt. Look at this gamble from AD here. So again, what have we talked about with the Nuggets? They're looking to run in transition. Transition defense is key for the Lakers. AD gambles in the backcourt. Now we have uh, an advantage situation. As a result, we're going to get another cross match. So AD was originally on DeAndre Jordan. That's his matchup. If AD is on DeAndre Jordan, he can be sitting right down here, sitting in help, dealing with whatever aggressive move Jamal Murray makes. Jamal's been hitting this like hard spin move towards the baseline off of the left block uh, uh, all year long. It's one of my favorite post moves that he does. But typically, if there's backside help, this will be a fadeaway, and it turns into a shot he's going to make a little less than half the time. But instead, there's no help there because uh, Anthony Davis is glued up on Michael Porter Jr. on the weak side, so he's able to make that aggressive move all the way to the basket. Now it's a layup instead of, uh, instead of an Anthony Davis block or a tough turnaround jump shot. Here's another really bad offensive possession off the Peyton Watson miss. Again, this is just really bad execution. It's a 13-point game with nine minutes left. This is still a game. We're going to get a little flare screen from Torian Prince on Christian Brown. Austin's going to kind of catch around the logo. There's 17 seconds left. Run some offense. Nope, we're going to jack up a 30-footer that is way short. And then, once again, watch the transition defense here. AD gambles, walking. Again, this is not over. You're, you would think the game is over with the body language from the Lakers here. They came down from twenty to beat. Uh, came from down twenty to beat the Clippers once this year in the fourth quarter. Now we're jogging. Now we're jogging. Now this is if you're a Nuggets fan from last year, and you imagine Bruce Brown in this spot. This is where Bruce Brown killed D'Lo last year. Jogging back in transition defense, slot drives in transition. Brown just bullies him, loses control of the basketball, and easily gets it back and puts it in. This is going to be a good Laker defensive possession where they get killed on the offensive glass. So screen, Austin fights, Austin fights, Austin gets a, 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 a gets back on Jamal. There's no advantage. We're going to get another screen here with Michael Porter Jr. We get a little bit of a, it was, uh, it looked like it was probably going to be a hedge and recover, but it turns into a switch. Austin gets back. We get a stunt from D'Lo. 
and Austin gets a contest. Still a decent look for Denver. But here we got this matchup underneath the basket here. Watch our matchup as the shot goes up. LeBron, right on the left block, ready for a rebound. AD, right on the right block, ready for a rebound. Again, 13-point game, eight minutes left. This is there for the taking. Watch Christian Brown and DeAndre Jordan just flat out out-hustle LeBron and AD. Christian Brown comes in, somehow beats LeBron to the basketball, tips it up, and then DeAndre Jordan beats AD to it and taps it out. Now, this ends up being a turnover anyway, but that's just an example of like, that can't happen. That literally can't happen. Like, you, you are not good enough to beat Denver making that many mistakes. One little uh, a misread for the Lakers here in pick and roll from Anthony Davis. So uh, Peyton Watson's on LeBron. We're going to get the ball screen to attack DeAndre Jordan. DeAndre Jordan's in a bit of a high drop. AD is going to catch. Boom. This is an easy read. Austin's open. Jamal's tagging the roller. Austin's open. Make that kick out pass. That's a good look. Instead, AD challenges everybody underneath the basket and misses. So to kind of put a bow on it, like again, this the uh when it comes to when it comes down to the Lakers and their chances to win this series, they're slim to begin with. And the only pathway forward for the Lakers is they have to go toe to toe with the Denver as an execution team. If they do, some variance can come into play. What if AD does score over Jokic as easily did at the end of the game? What if LeBron does outplay Jamal Murray? What if Jamal Murray has more poor shooting nights? like he did last night. What if you do get better shooting out of Austin and D'Lo? All of a sudden, a pathway starts to form. But it's a very, very... Uh, the way I presented it in the regular season is like there's a tiny crack in the door and there's somebody on the other side pushing it. They have the advantage. If you're going to blow through that crack, you literally have to be perfect, especially in terms of their execution. And I just... When I went back and looked at the film this morning, I'm like, like there are these brief stretches where their execution gets so abysmally bad that they they deliver these like haymakers to their chances to, to have any chance to contend in the game and like it's been a big problem for them all season they've tried to tell us who they are it was a frustrating film session to watch all right uh, last thing i wanted to hit today before we get out of here so um there's this prevailing narrative that's been flying around and like literally it, last night, I think the Lakers had 19 free throws, which by the way is below their season average by a lot. Uh, but the Nuggets happened to have six free throws in this very physical basketball game, right? And so it became a thing again, right? Like the Los Angeles Lakers, they have this massive free throw differential. They are clearly benefiting from some sort of league-wide conspiracy to get the Lakers into position to win basketball games, even though they're bad at winning basketball games compared to some of their peers at the top of the league. So even if the Lakers or even if the league is trying to rig the Lakers into winning, it's just not happening for whatever reason. But, you know, this has been one of the dumbest things that I can ever remember seeing in my time covering the NBA. You guys know I am like never complain about officiating guy except in a league-wide context as it pertains to the way the game is officiated. But I think blaming the refs for anything involving your team outcome is a loser mentality. And generally speaking, it does it's not going to help you in any way. And almost always it's wishful thinking and not based on any evidence, right? So one of the things that I think gets lost in this, the Lakers do have a massive free throw differential, larger than anyone else in the the, uh, the rest of the league by a wide margin. That's a fact right? Here's what's also a fact. The Lakers are top three in both free throw attempts drawn and defending without fouling, okay? There are teams that get a better whistle than the Lakers. Did you know that the Orlando Magic get a better whistle than the Los Angeles Lakers? They get to the foul line more frequently. The problem is they can't defend without fouling, so they don't have as much of a disparity. You know who's the best team in the league at defending without fouling? The Boston Celtics, as a matter of fact, they are second place in free throw differential. You want to know why there's a big gap? Because while the Lakers are top three in both, the Celtics are number one in defending without fouling, but they are 24th in getting to the foul line because they're a team that takes a ton of jump shots and doesn't put a lot of pressure on the rim and don't do a great job kind of grifting their way to the line. And so as a result, Lakers have this big margin and the margin for the next team, the Boston Celtics, the second place team is not as big, but everyone wants to act like this is some sort of highly unusual thing. 
the I want to show you guys a graphic to demonstrate this point. Do you guys see this mark right here? That's the free throw differential of the 2024 Los Angeles Lakers. Do you see this mark right here? This is the free throw differential for the 2018 Charlotte Hornets. Do you think it was a big scheme of the NBA to give the Charlotte Hornets a better chance to win NBA games? Did you know that neither the 2023 or the 2024 Lakers are even in the top 40 for free throw differential since the merger? It is There is absolutely nothing remarkable about the Lakers free throw differential except for the fact that it's the Los Angeles Lakers. That's the only remarkable thing about it. These See this chart, guys? Every one of these pieces of data represents the team that led the league in free throw differential that year. There's nothing remarkable about these two Lakers teams. Nothing about it is remarkable. It's literally one of the dumbest things I have ever seen. The only reason they have a massive disparity is the majority of the teams in the league are either good at defending without fouling or good at getting to the line, but not both. And the Lakers are top three in both. That is the only thing that is driving that disparity. I swear, th this Laker free throw conspiracy, it, it, it reminds me of election deniers in the sense that the only piece of evidence they have is they don't like the outcome. If this was literally the Denver Nuggets, which by the way, the reason the Denver Nuggets aren't on this list as high is because they're bad at defending without fouling. They commit a lot of fouls, so they don't have a free throw disparity. That's why. But if it was the Denver Nuggets, who is top three in both categories and leading the league in free throw differential, the conversation would be, the, the, the actual conversation would just be, Mike Malone's an amazing coach coaching this defense that doesn't foul. And my goodness, can Jamal Murray and Nikola Jokic get the defense out of position and get to the line? The only thing remarkable about it is that it's the Lakers. And, you know, I, I had a mailbag question from somebody today that was like, D if you dig into the data, you'll see. This is the data, guys. This is the data. Th this is the reality of free throw differential around the league. The 2018 Charlotte Hornets. Really good at defending without fouling. Really good at getting to the foul line. Substantially more so than the Lakers. Literally 50% more effective as a differential team than this Lakers team. You probably have no... You probably couldn't even name who was on the 2018 Hornets roster. But because it's the Lakers, it's this big story. So hopefully that'll put that to rest. And guess what? I think the Lakers are going to lose the Denver Nuggets. And the reason why they're going to lose is because they're not as good at basketball. It's not going to be because the refs didn't do a good enough job rigging the games in their favor. Stop it with that loser mentality bullshit. No one's getting any smarter of, of, because of it. Everyone's getting dumber. And it's honestly just not based in any sort of evidential fact. All right. I'm off of my soapbox for today. Uh, again, we're going to be back tonight with Colin Coward after the Pacers-Bucks game. We're going to break that game down as well as a bunch of other stuff from this weekend. Uh, the Thunder versus Pelicans game, I'm going to break down on Monday morning with some film sessions for some other teams around the league. As always, I sincerely appreciate you guys for supporting the show. I will see you later tonight with Colin.